Good afternoon. Welcome to everyone to the second in our series on disability competent care. I hope we have some participants from last week's webinar and some new folks as well. My name is Laura Dummett and I'm with the Lewin Group. The first thing that I would like to do is to just point out some features of our technology. If you will look at the icons at the bottom of your screen, um, well, first of all, uh, this isn't an icon. If, you're, um, if the slides are not advancing on your computer, hit F5 and that will refresh and get things moving again. Um, we have an icon that is circled on the left of your screen. That is where you go to write in questions. You can ask questions about either the technology, if you can't hear or if something isn't showing up, type in a question and then behind the scenes that will be answered. Um, you can also at any time put in questions to the presenters. We are going to be compiling those questions and we will come back to them at the end. We would Would encourage everyone to um, put their question in as soon as they think about it. And right there in the middle is a closed captioning icon. Um, if you want to use that feature, you just click on the icon and um, the closed captioning will uh, appear. Now um, let me introduce this um, as I said, second of three webinars that we will be presenting in September. The first, which was last week, was on disability competent care. What is it and why is it important? Today you are listening to Understanding the Lived Experience of Disability. Next week we are presenting the third in this series, the Care Management Relationship. These are all scheduled to be 45 minutes in length and then we're reserving 15 minutes for question and answer. And while all three of these webinars are related, you do not necessarily need to listen to all three to understand the content of any one of the, site, of the um, series. I also want to point out at the bottom of this screen and actually at the bottom of every one of the slides, the um, uh, website www.resourcesforintegratedcare.com. All of these webinars will be archived there and we also have um, several other products that are on the website that we encourage you all to look at. And in fact, I would like you all to know that these webinars and everything else that is presented on the website are, were developed under a contract uh, with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Medicare Medicaid Coordination Office. The Lewin Group along with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement have worked under contract with MMCO to develop tools and support for providers as they seek to integrate care for dual eligibles, that is people who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. And this webinar series is one of those products under that contract. What we would like from you today after this webinar is finished is your help. Um, we know that there's a lot more that we could do to support providers under this contract. So we're seeking your ideas on topics, we're seeking your ideas on audiences, and your feedback on how we're doing. Um, at the end of this webinar, there will be a short survey. We'd really appreciate it if you would fill that out um, and help us as um, we continue this work. Now I am going to uh, turn things over to Chris Duff who is the Executive Director of the Disability Practice Institute, and Chris is going to get the content moving. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate the introduction to the webinar here. Um, my full role this morning is to introduce the speakers, and then I'll be available to support them in questions at the end. 
The two presenters today are June isaacson Kales and Mary Lou Breslin. June was one of the co-authors in the Disability Competency Assessment Tool that we developed and is on the website that Laura referenced earlier. Much of this webinar series is based on that, the content of that assessment tool. June is a National Disability Policy Consultant with 35 plus years experience training healthcare providers and insurers, government entities, and independent living centers in disability competency and accessibility. She is currently the Associate Director of the Center for Disability Issues and the Health Professions at Western University of Health Sciences in Southern California. Mary Lou Breslin has been a dis disability civil rights lawyer and policy advocate for over 35 years also. In 1979, she co-founded the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, known as DREDIS, which is a leading, if not the leading, National Disability Rights Law and Policy Center and presently serves as Senior Policy Advisor directing the organization's health care initiatives. She has written and presented widely on various disability rights topics, focusing most recently on health care access. Now I'll hand it over to June, who will start off today. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, as you see, our, our webinar is... Uh, We'll cover the lived experience and the barriers faced by many people with disabilities. We'll talk about the two-pronged view of healthcare access and some of the barriers faced by people with disabilities in accessing healthcare and some points about uh, decreasing barriers and accommodating people. Okay, over to you, Mary Lou. Thanks very much, June, um, and hello, everybody. <clears throat> um, the purpose of the webinar today is to talk about the lived experience of disability um, as it relates to accessing health care. Uh, for those of you who attended the first webinar in this series, um, you'll remember that the presenters um, introduced the idea that um, people with disabilities experience significant health disparities um, that don't necessarily have a direct relationship to their impairment. Health disparities um, among people with disabilities, as you know, are likely owed to a variety of very complicated factors. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, we know that social determinants of health play a role in disparities. Um, for example, in the context of disability, people with disabilities experience high levels of poverty and material hardship, which make it difficult often to acquire care and engage in disease prevention. So it's against this backdrop um, that we want to talk about what some of the specific root causes are. Um, substantial research has been um, undertaken over the last decade, and it's revealed essentially three major problems. Um, first is the lack of provider awareness and education about disability. And this results in misinformation and stereotypes um, about people with disabilities, and that can affect outcomes of care <coughs> and disease prevention. Second, the limited capacity of healthcare providers to accommodate people with disabilities in healthcare settings um, are, is also a significant problem. For example, um, policies that don't um, ensure sufficient flexibility so that people um, often um, who require such, um, such flexibility um, as extended exam time to ensure effective communication <clears throat> or for any kind of physical assistance that might be required. And third, um, physical barriers such as inaccessible facilities um, and exam equipment such as exam tables, weight scales, mammography equipment, and so on. So it's um, in, against this backdrop, um, the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund has produced a series of video interviews with people with disabilities who discuss really quite candidly their experiences attempting to acquire health care. And these interviews can be accessed on the website at the URL shown on the slide. But I want to just um, sort of pause at this point and um, show a you a few short excerpts from these videos that illustrate some of the problems and barriers that I've just mentioned and that put really a human face on these complex issues. And just by way of introduction, the brief three-minute video presents snippets from longer interviews featured on the website I just mentioned. So could we just now take a look at the video and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about what we saw. 
and we're going to hope our technology works today. Interviewed at the Ed Roberts campus, Berkeley, California, 2012. So when the doctors told me I, they wanted me to go to our nursing home, it just felt like my life as I knew it was over. Nobody was listening to me. But that, uh, that accompanying the love that and the next thing I know, he's filled a syringe with a drug. He has, without any commentary, rammed the needle into Charlie's shoulder, and I look and notice that the needle is at a, you know, a 90 degree angle. And so I, I'm, I'm watching Charlie, who's now becoming hysterical, and I'm crying out, what in the world are you doing? What is happening here? <laughs> There have been policy papers written by every major organization, the National Council on Disability, the Institute of Medicine, the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, the Surgeon General, uh, about health care for people with disabilities and people with developmental disabilities. And they all come to the same conclusion, which is that we need to train health care providers. Health care stories made possible with generous support from okay, the Special um, Hope Foundation. Let's just um, pick it up from there. <clears throat> so the people you saw in this video um, speak very candidly about their experiences seeking health care. Elizabeth Grigsby, the first woman who you met, is a longtime wheelchair user who has cerebral palsy and who's been living independently in her own home for a number of years. She is employed, she has a part-time job, and she's supported with personal attendants who she hires and trains. And I give you that background about her because in her interview she describes repeated communication problems and issues she experienced with her health care providers. She sums up, I think, quite eloquently her experience by saying that they just were not listening to her. And as a result, she was threatened with unnecessary institutionalization. Denise Jacobson, uh, who is one of the people who you just met, is an author, a wife, a mother, an educator. Um, she reads an excerpt from a letter a specialist wrote to her primary care physician, which indicates a deep level of misunderstanding and truly a lack of knowledge about the lives of adults with disabilities, and the letter was really rife with stereotypes. Uh, Fred Neeson, a practicing attorney, uh, remarks on um, how he's often treated as though he doesn't have the capacity to make his own decisions and respond to questions simply because of his speech impairment. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about these three individuals and their experiences, I urge you to take a look at their full interviews. So what lessons can we learn from these stories? Um, it, it seems to me that several themes run through these excerpts. Disability stereotyping, negative assumptions, and misinformation affect the quality of the health care these people received. While provider education is required at all levels, as Dr. Kripke noted in her remarks about the national studies that have drawn attention to the issue, it's equally important for managed care plans and other plans to understand the types of accommodations people with disabilities might require and to be prepared to assist them in acquiring these accommodations. And finally, um, providers uh, within health plan networks should be assessed 
to determine their capacity to appropriately care for people with disabilities, um, and a plan should maintain information about um, this capacity that members might require and might, might, be able, might need to um, ask questions about. Tools are available to assist plans and physicians, and some are available through the resources section noted at the end of this webinar. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. This will be slide eight. Okay, can we just go, go on to the next slide, please? Good, thank you. Um, disability competent care, um, from our standpoint, encourages a viewpoint about disability that triangulates and integrates the disability experience. Um, that's the clinical, not only the clinical the disability experience, but the clinical aspects of impairment and the functional limitations that flow from impairment that may require accommodations in clinical and diagnostic settings. We make these distinctions because they're, they are often confused in clinical settings and care decisions and, out, and outcomes can be negatively affected. For example, one of the people we interviewed for our healthcare video project had a lifetime mental health disability. When she sought care for a lump on her scalp, her healthcare provider thought her complaint was a manifestation of her mental health diagnosis. In fact, later tests revealed that she had a tumor. This is an example of the perception of disability and appropriately influencing clinical judgment. And just in a quick personal example, I recently had an echocardiogram, and as a longtime wheelchair user with a neuromuscular disability, um, I need assistance to transfer onto an examination table. Echocardiograms are typically conducted in a supine position, but mine was conducted while I sat in my wheelchair, uh, presumably because it was too time consuming to arrange a transfer onto the table. It happens that the results were compromised because the back portion of the heart could not be seen clearly due to the fact that I was not lying down when the test was conducted. In these examples, a disability competent care approach would have been considered the would have considered the disability experience along with the clinical aspects of the impairment and the appropriate accommodations that might be required to ensure effective testing and diagnosis. Okay, those are just a few examples that put a human face. Um, on the experience of disability in healthcare. So I'm going to turn this over to June now, who's going to talk about the two-pronged definition of access to care. Okay, thanks, Mary Lou. Well, prong one covers the fact that everyone needs access to timely health care that is affordable and has quality providers in usable locations. So prong one, one is well understood, the right doctor, the right care, doctor, specialist, level of care, the right place, the ability to get care, to get to it, and the right time in a reasonable time frame. But we have to add more than these rights to prong two to achieve real access for people with disabilities. So the second prong of access is actually often overlooked. So prong two is where access gets drilled down in terms of meaning, because it also involves getting to, into, through facilities, on and off of medical equipment to be able to communicate and as needed to receive assistance getting coordinated clinical and community-based services. So uh, back to you, Mary Lou. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, let's just uh, put a, um, some data uh, to work here to describe what June just mentioned. Um, just to add a little dimension um, to the third bullet in particular on the list June just read, I want to just point to a, a study of access barriers that um, were surveyed by managed care health plan nurses on site at primary care practices located in multiple counties in California. Um, this study revealed that um, among 20, over 2,300 healthcare provider locations in the state, only 8.4% of providers had a height adjustable examination table, and even more surprisingly, only 3.6% had available and accessible weight scale. So it really shouldn't come as any surprise then that people with certain mobility limitations are not likely to be examined 
using best practice techniques if they can't get on the examination table or be weighed. Um, so we point out the fact that data is supporting the fact that um, equipment is often not, not available or not accessible to people with disabilities and the impact uh, on their, out, their medical outcomes can be quite significant. Okay, let's go on to um, the next slide. In an additional study, which adds some additional weight to uh, the concerns that we're raising about um, accessibility of, of medical services and facilities, um, a study that was recently published in the Annals of um, Internal Medicine uh, conducted by residents um, at a medical facility in Boston who telephoned 256 specialty practices in locations across the country and asked if the practice could accommodate a patient who was described as a large individual who used a wheelchair. And the results were quite startling. Um, some of you may have read uh, the results of this study, which were featured in a piece recently in the New York Times. Um, of the review of 256 specialty providers, 56 of the providers, or 22%, reported that they could not accommodate the patient. 4% reported that the building itself in which their practice was housed was physically inaccessible. Uh, 48 or 18% reported the, in, their inability to transfer a patient from a wheelchair to an examination table. And only 22% reported the use of height adjustable tables or a lift for a transfer. And the, the practices of gynecology um, were, was the subspecialty with the highest rate of inaccessible practices at 44%, quite, quite a startling figure. Um, in this specialty study, practices were really very open about the reason they were refusing um, the patient, and that's because uh, he, or he was uh, defined as a, as a person who was heavy and who used a wheelchair. They, rep they showed very little understanding of federal law that requires accessibility features, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act, not to mention the need for um, accommodations to ensure best practices for all patients, including people with disabilities. Um, the disability competent care philosophy recognizes that people with disabilities encounter these barriers, and it works proactively with providers and health plans and advocates and others to build collaborative service delivery systems with fewer barriers. So now I'm just going to turn this back over to June. Okay. Thanks, Marilu. So for many, without prong two, maneuvering through the healthcare system is actually a complex and dense minefield full of access, attitudinal, and competency barriers. And a common impact of these barriers is the feelings of being beat down by the experience of, for some, intolerable hassle factors. Can't get transportation, can't get accessible parking, can't get into the office, can't understand the information, can't get on the equipment. These experiences can culminate in a real assortment of feelings of frustration, fatigue, failure, and fear. And for some, continuing the effort of pursuing care is just too exhausting, too overwhelming, or too degrading. And this can lead to postponing or avoiding care, resulting in a downward spiral of lack of care, delayed diagnosis, worsening conditions, leading to deteriorating health that eventually requires more expensive and extensive health care. A colleague of mine once said, you know, when I go for health care, I want to focus on my care. I don't want the process of getting health care to be my career. So let's take a look at these elements and at removing these barriers. Attitudinal access is another key element of prong two. And part of the disability core competencies training needs to include a process of having healthcare personnel examine these beliefs and biases, 
prejudices, and stereotypes and fears regarding disability. Where did they come from and how they may affect working with and the health care of people with disabilities? So in terms of stereotypes, um, these are, are common. And look at the next slide in terms of the reactions that people hear from their providers. Negative attitudes and misconceptions of the of people can contribute to, again, wide gaps in healthcare disparities. Now, you might laugh at these, but you know, we didn't make any of these up. So people have been told, you know, there's no reason for someone like you to be tested for AIDS. The test should be administered to those who really need it, i.e., people who are sexually active. Or it's best that you not have children. Or you don't have to worry about osteoporosis because you can't walk. Or, of course, you smoke. You know, if I were you, I'd smoke too. Or getting a mammogram is hard for you, so you can just skip it. Take uh, Sandra Jensen, a 36-year-old woman with a developmental disability who was at first rejected for her heart-lung transplant because doctors assumed she would not be capable of handling her follow up care. Two different hospitals actually rejected her as a candidate for a transplant because of her disability. But after intensive pressure from the disability community, Stanford Medical Center did perform the surgery, and her doctors reported that she followed her complicated medical regime without a problem. Another example, a wheelchair user needing to start chemotherapy was told, this is an ambulatory clinic, and you are a wheelchair user. You can't walk. So we can't take care of you here. And I was once told by a specialist I had just started seeing, you know, I thought you'd need a lot of extra care and attention until you began asking questions. Attitudes also affect expectations. Note the contrast in how these messages are communicated. You'll never be able to work again versus you'll have to explore alternatives that will allow you to continue to work. Or you will always be an invalid versus we will have you explore ways to use your strengths and skills to meet your goals. Or talking to parents or a spouse for a child, you'll have to take care of them versus Together, you can explore ways to maximize their independence. And one more dramatic example. Tom, a man with cerebral palsy, was wheeled in the grand rounds on a stretcher, wearing a hospital gown. After Tom was wheeled out of the room, the third-year medical students were asked to evaluate his rehabilitation potential. They thought he may be able to work at selling pencils in the neighborhood or in a supportive work environment. Meanwhile, Tom changed back into his white coat, white medical coat, and he returned to the classroom. And now these same students had to deal with him in an entirely different way. As Tom put it, these students had a bias when they saw me on the stretcher. And then they had to deal with Tom Strax, MD, doctor, physiatrist, associate professor, and assistant medical director, which was a very interesting leap. The students had to confront the difference between their beliefs 
and Tom's reality, capabilities, and status. So moving along, communication access, another part of prompt two, to get, understand, and use the information and using offering the right auxiliary aid and service. Now this access is the least understood and where the greatest mistakes are made. <clears throat> Seeing, hearing, speaking, reading, remembering, and understanding. Cognitive and intellectual abilities and limited language proficiency prevent many people from receiving and understanding health information. Excuse me. <clears throat> many benefit with and without disability from being offered information in audio formats, particularly helpful to those with seeing, learning, and reading limitations. And many benefit from written information that summarizes information, handouts, emails, and many more benefit from health well and wellness information and education information that um, is provided in these alternate formats, something that we need to work with vendors to insist that they supply more frequently to, to us. The need for and use of an assisted listening device, which amplifies volume, can make the difference in effectively communicating with people who are hard of hearing. And next slide, almost everyone benefits from the use of pictures that are easy to understand. And people benefit from demonstrations. These pictures illustrate, for example, when to take meds, or how to use eye drops. Website access is critical to avoid having to later do expensive website retrofits. You know, use of the electronic health record or the personal health record and portals that allow us to make appointments, communicate with doctors, renew prescriptions, etc., are growing exponentially. So access is key. For me, I take advantage of sometimes downloading these forms and filling them out before I get to a provider. Or I bring my own set of information to the provider already ready to submit. The problem is that sometimes when I get there and they say fill out these forms and I say, well, everything's here that you need, I've checked. And they say, oh, no, 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 you have to use our forms, or you have to put them on the right color sheet. And I say, if you want to be able to read the information, you put it on your forms. And I get a look. In terms of access to uh, next medical equipment, there's a lot of magical thinking about this. So as we see in this slide, one piece of magical thinking goes like this, where in the next slide, the provider says, just hop up. And magically, this uh, wheelchair user is supposed to hop on the trampoline, do a triple somersault, and somehow land on the exam table. Gymnastics at its best. So there are a lot of things that make equipment inaccessible. You know, sometimes we hear directions like, look here, read this, listen up, stay still, don't breathe. That can be a difficult to impossible for people with a variety of functional limitations. And next slide, here's me on a bad hair day practicing my circus lay act, getting on an exam table. And for some, 
well-placed grab bars are helpful, but for others, getting transfer assistance is critical. Lift teams, lift equipment, and lift training is lacking in many places. Hence, we often hear this, well, like Mary Lou said, we'll just examine you in your chair. This is common, but a substandard and representation of unequal treatment. One survey responder told us, you know, exam chairs are impossible to get in and out of, and I have to have my husband or an office worker help me. I've delayed visits to the doctor's offices because it takes a village to get me on and off an exam table, which means I don't go for preventive care appointments. And getting weighed? Well, believe it or not, some people actually do have to go to this picture loading dock to get weighed or the hospital laundry, and that's only if you're lucky. You know, getting weighed on successful scale needs to be where all the other vital equipment is. Getting weighed is a vital part of the standard of care for many visits. And being told to guess your weight is unequal and inadequate care. Another prong of access to vital is physical access. As you see in the next slide, physical access means planning for accessibility, but not, as pictured here, this tight exam room with no room for transferring, no room for maneuvering, and no height adjustability to aid in transferring, and no restrooms that are usable. Or waiting areas that are too tight and too small to accommodate mobility devices. Or accessible routes. These paths of travel barriers, you know, are barely perceptible to most people. But they might as well be the Great Wall of China for people needing accessible routes to get to the healthcare facility. Physical access is probably the best understood of accessibility, but not necessarily available. And providers must be aware and know and provide the information to member services so they can share accurate information regarding accessible providers when asked and when needed. Physical access must be a part of readiness and network and the network capacity equation. Coordinating care can be exasperating. As pictured here in this next slide, understanding how to use the sometimes complex network Getting providers to talk to each other is something that is, well, that we'll cover in a lot more detail in the next webinar. But navigating and coordination includes what I call quality service accommodation alerts. That is, what front office and back office staff need to pay attention to in terms of needing longer appointments, assistance transferring, using a high-low table, the adjustable table, use of an accessible scale, getting an interpreter for an appointment, using the assisted listening device, and health records, whether electronic or paper, should flag these QSAs. For me, after 20 years of seeing the same provider, they finally got it right only after I said, how many decades will it take for you to understand I need that height adjustable table? 
And I said, put a note on front of the chart that I need this. So people with disabilities, they want to be an active partner in their care, not passive. People want to actively share in goal setting and be respected for our experiences. This model respects the expertise of participants who have lived with their disability and their unique health care needs. Many have sophisticated knowledge about their own bodies, and most successfully have selected and know the approaches that work best for them. People can be active problem solvers if we honor their years of living with and knowing what works. So, last story. You know, I went for a mammogram a couple of years ago, and there was a new clinician. And I explained, it takes two people to help me hold still in the right contorted position. And the provider said, oh, I've been doing this for years. Let's do it my way. And I said, you know, I've been doing it for years, too. Let's not do it your way because I know what works. Or the common transfer battle that people sometimes have goes something like this. I know you're taught to transfer people that way, but trust me, with me, this is a more effective way. So to summarize this, real access is not just installation. The best access, well, attention to details and the training may actually never happen. It's not just having the elements, the tools, and the services, the physical, the equipment, the communication, the attitudinal, and the navigation and coordination access. It's knowing where they are, how to use them, and really having the experience to do so. Uh, I Readiness takes time. This is multiple exposure material that needs to be incorporated into your processes, procedures, protocols, policies, and practice. So there's much we can do because we're all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. And there is a slide with resources available for you and reference materials and much more on the website listed at the bottom of of these slides. So back to you, Laura. Thank you very much. That was a really um, very compelling presentation. Uh, Cynthia, would you open the phone lines now for questions? Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star then zero on your touch tone phone. Um, you'll hear a tone indicating you've been placed in queue and operator will take your name and further instruct you. If you're using a speakerphone, you will need to pick up the handset before pressing the numbers. Once again, for questions or comments, it's star zero. Thank you. And while we are waiting for um, some questionnaires to queue up, we got an early question from John Arnold, who, first of all, thanks for this um, putting a face to the problem. Um, he then goes on to ask um, whether you have considered how to engage or activate consumers to engage with their providers or in their models of care. Uh, June, do you want to start um, and answer that question, please? Sure. And, and we, John, we are going to spend a lot more time in on that issue in subsequent um, webinars. But the DCC model really does emphasize the interdisciplinary care team's role in helping a provider to strengthen their active participation in healthcare, sometimes through coaching and motivational uh, counseling. It's a critical part 
to make this all work and supporting people in really talking and requesting and being clear about what they need and not falling back to a more passive role in terms of um, health care and not accepting what they know could easily go wrong unless they indeed speak up clearly, loudly, and often repetitively. Mary Lou, you want to add anything to that? Well, I just wanted to add that um, <clears throat> I think that there's um, a, a significant move now um, based on the fact that there are there's such an interest in moving um, low-income people with disabilities into managed care uh, that many of the managed care organizations are um, being asked by both CMS and states to involve stakeholders, um, including seniors and people with disabilities, in the decision-making processes that they're undertaking now um, through the various kinds of advisory committees and advisory boards and through consultation. So I think that the process of involving um, consumers in development of policies and practices is just beginning to um, gain some credibility and some resonance and is increasing, at least in some states, um, in an institutional way, particularly through the managed care systems. Mary, Mary Lou, this is Chris. Let me give one concrete example of something we did in Minnesota. We had a member advisory group, got together every single month, open meeting, and over half of the meeting time was dedicated to the concept of open mic. We would simply discuss whatever was on people's minds. And that was extremely useful for us to stay on top of what was really happening. Some of it is they let us know about perhaps our phone system that wasn't working well. But one concrete example was someone was saying they had an accident recently in the, in the transport because the wheelchair wasn't tied down well enough. And that got three other people to pipe in and say, you know, that happened to me last month. And out of that just simple discussion, we realized we needed to do an initiative around working with transportation providers on appropriate wheelchair tie-downs. That's simple, but that's an example of how listening to the group and just simply engaging with them can can teach you a great deal. Um, let me just add a quick um, um, footnote to that, Chris, if I could. Uh, we're working with um, a managed care organization in Northern California <clears throat> that's making a going to be making um, the transition to serving um, duly eligible beneficiaries, people who are on I have both Medicare and Medicaid. And this particular plan has put together um, a fairly extensive advisory. Um, work group made up of organizations that serve seniors and people with disabilities, many of whom are run and directed by seniors and people with disabilities, um, to serve as advisors in the course of developing um, this transition. And this has been a very uh, proactive, candid, open period for discussion, for sort of fine-tuning the process that's being used to advance these new programs. Um, and I think that it's been a it's been a real interesting model, and would certainly encourage, um, particularly health plans that are in this process now or in a process like this, um, to look at that as as a good example. It's just a complement to what you talked about in Minnesota. This is Laura. I'm going to read one more question that we got um, through the chat feature, and then I'm going to um, after. Um, a quick answer to that, I'm going to turn over to Cynthia to see if there's anyone on the line. This question came in from Rachel Robeson from Caremore. How do you deal with providers and staff that do either of two things when verbally communicating? One is talking to the caregiver or family member only, or speaking only to the patient and disregarding the caregiver in strict adherence to HIPAA. Well, this is Mary Lou. Let me just jump in and say that I think the um, the basic um, rule for communication is that uh, the the person who is receiving care is the person with whom the provider should be communicating, and uh, the family member, the friend, the partner, the caregiver who might be accompanying the person to a visit um, should be 
mindful of directing the providers of a communication to the person themselves if the person themselves has not been successful in doing that on their own behalf. Um, it is true that communications are proprietary um, in terms of HIPAA, um, but in general, the, um, there are um, permissions given for individuals who are assisting people um, to be a party to those communications. So the more important issue, I think, is the recognition of the expertise of the individual who's receiving care. Uh, it's not the, the very typical example in a restaurant where someone will, uh, a, a wait person will ask, uh, someone accompanying a person with a disability, what they want to order, um, very typically happens in the medical setting as well, uh, rather than asking the individual what's going on with them. So I think the, the, the etiquette and protocol is to um, make sure that uh, every party involved in the process to make sure that the questions and interaction are directed to the person who's affected by the care. And that includes the actual person knowing that they can say and coaching them to say, you know, you really need to be talking directly to me. Back to you, Laura. Thank you. Um, Cynthia, is there anyone with a question on the line now? And I'm showing no questions in queue at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, let me um, return back to uh, a couple of questions that we got online. Um, first of all, here's um, one question that came in, this may be very basic, but what do I do if I simply don't understand what the person is saying? Uh -huh. It's June here. Uh, that's really a common issue, and it's communication access, and there are a number of things you can do. Sometimes, for example, with Denise Jacobson in the video, um, Sometimes it just takes a little bit of getting used to their cerebral palsy accent to relax, take a deep breath, and to always to never guess what people are saying, to never finish a sentence. And if you just can't understand, to actually communicate with someone like Denise and say, Denise, I'm just not understanding you. What What should we do? How can we... How can we make this communication work? Sometimes it, it's good to partner with another provider or assistant who may just have a better ability to understand somebody, for example, with a CP accent. But problem solve with the person. This is Mary Lou. I would just like to just add that I think in that situation, um, Anxiety and fear may be interfering with the ability to communicate. The, the anxiety of not understanding what the person is saying, and June's uh, recommendation to take a deep breath, start over, and don't don't be fearful about asking specifically um, for the person to repeat what they've said because you don't understand them. They want you to understand them, and uh, you want to understand them. So the process of um, sort of requesting that they repeat what they've said is. And, and understood in very typical way of um, going about ensuring that the communication is effective. And as you wait for that to happen in, in the emergency world, sometimes we say, let's just agree, show me a way that you would say yes, show me a way that you would indicate no, or that you would indicate I don't know, as an interim way while you problem solve about a better way a more effective way to communicate. Laura, back to you. Okay, thank you. Up on your screen now, you will see um, a URL. We would really appreciate it if you would click on that and fill out our short survey. We really want to uh, make these webinars and all of the products under this, um, this initiative useful for you in your work. So please take a minute to fill out that survey. And I am going to just preview to you what the next slide says, which is about our third webinar, which is next Tuesday at 2 o'clock, which is going to be on the care management relationship. 
we, uh, the next slide after this uh, you will see is um, contact information of all of our speakers and um, our key contact at CMS, Carrie Brannick. And um, as uh, June and Mary Lou said earlier, here are some um, uh, materials for you to reference in your spare time. I want to remind you all that this webinar and the one we held last week are going to be posted to the um, URL that's at the bottom of each of these slides. Again, that's www resourcesforintegratedcare.com. Further, you will receive an email in the next day or two that will include this link um, so that you have access to all of the materials we're presenting and developing under this contract. Thank you very much, and that takes us to the end of this webinar. Thank you.